Obviously, one of the major contributions to our understanding of the riots was the Reading the Riots study. What, what would you say was the, some of the central findings that come from, from that piece of work then? I think the, the, the kind of crucial thing about Reading the Riots was it was quite an unusual study. So in contrast with a lot of social science research, it was done very quickly. Mm. So the initial phase, which focused on the rioters themselves, was probably conducted over a period of 15 or 16 weeks. It was quite short. Mm, very quick. So, you know, from raising money, recruiting staff, doing the field work, analysing the data, publishing it in the newspaper was 16 or 17 weeks max, I should think. So extraordinarily quick. And it was the reason for saying that, I think, is its purpose was to be quick, precisely so as to try to be a part of public and political debate. Mm. Um, our concern, among many, I think, and you know, lots of people will have had similar concerns, which was, was politicians and others were making a whole series of statements about the riots, um, about what caused them and why mm. people were out on the streets and how we should understand it, and therefore what the public policy response should be. Mm. And we felt that you know, at best some of those statements were pretty far-fetched and certainly weren't evidence-based. And so the attempt was to try to collect some evidence to influence political debate. And I think, um, broadly speaking, um, probably the main outcomes of at least that first phase of reading the riots were A, to challenge the idea that this was somehow orchestrated, that the riots were orchestrated by gangs. Um, there was no evidence of that at all. Um, indeed, in London in particular, there was a truce call between gangs. Um, secondly, I think to challenge the idea that somehow this was just, or in David Cameron's terms, sheer criminality, that somehow this is precisely the behavior you would expect of young criminals on the streets. Mm. And again, I think it challenged that very successfully in all sorts of ways. Um, but thirdly, I think putting the police and police conduct at, or attitudes towards the police, history of poor police community relations and police conduct at the center of the narrative about mm. the riots. And in particular, I think um, Theresa May, the Home Secretary's decision to review stop and search practices, mm. which was obviously based on lots of influence, but was announced at the Reading the Riots conference. Mm. I think, you know, I think we can claim some small part at least mm. in in bringing that about. So I think that's, mm. that's kind of... Yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, the point that you make there about engaging academic research with public policy is, is, is something that requires us to sharpen up our act and make our evidence and analysis available far quicker than we normally do, you know, not simply being about a, uh, a journal publication exercise. The impact is, is, is far more political than that. Political processes are very, very quick. But I think it's relevant to focus on that issue about the way in which the discourse, the way in which the riots were represented in the media in particular, and that disconnect between academic research, evidence and theory, and the way in which they were represented was, was I think, qu quite shocking at times. And it struck me that that was one of the main issues, was the way in which our work around riots and crowds um, while making a significant impact in terms of police thinking and so on that had flowed from the G20 protests and the death of Mr Tomlinson, that suddenly all of that went out the window. Mm. And what was reasserted on the front page was mob psychology, mindlessness, and as you say, these ideas about uh, the violence being caused by criminal gangs uh, or simply being some kind of dysfunction within certain elements of society. And of course, reading the riots does place a focus on, on policing. Um, what, what would you say it is about policing that is important to understanding riots? First of all, <coughs> in terms of the focus on communities and what's happened since the riots mm -hmm. and investment and so forth, and I'm, I'm sure we will come back to this when we talk about Leeds, is it's remarkable, I think, the, you know, the, the, that standard discourse, as it were, manages to talk about disorder, riots on the streets, in particular communities, as if the relative impoverishment of those communities, and they almost always are mm. relatively impoverished communities, 
had no part to play, that poverty, that you know, social disengagement, that a general sense of disenfranchisement amongst many people who live in those communities, somehow doesn't seem to occur to politicians, or at least they are unwilling, and I'll come back to this in a moment, to acknowledge that those things may be important in our understanding of why on certain occasions things get out of control and riots occur. Now, the, the second thing I would say is, I mean, having said that, I'm not sure that this is terribly shocking in the sense that the standard political discourse around riots is always thus. It's always to seek stake scapegoats or folk devils or however one wants to, to, to think about these things. And so in a way, I, I, we possibly shouldn't be too shocked that the Prime Minister or the Home Secretary or the Commissioner of the Police or whoever seek, I think, to focus attention away from um, their own responsibilities as people in charge of public policy or indeed their responsibilities as senior officers in charge of you know, what their forces do. So, which brings you to back to the police, which I think is, you know, what the, the things that we were focusing on reading the riots were, were quite varied and they were varied from, you know, all the way from a spectrum of things, from a history of poor police community relationships in Broadwater Farm, or Chapel Town, even in Leeds, um, Toxteth, Hansworth, Moss Side, wherever else, through to the more immediate, but nonetheless kind of medium to long term sense that many of the people who are out on the streets talked about they, their, at best, very poor relationships with the police. And then, most particularly, the what was perceived to be, and I think in many ways very justifiably, the inappropriate use of police powers, particularly around stop and search and the oppressive mm. use of those powers within local communities, mm. focusing especially on particular groups, not least of all young black men. Mm. Very important that you bring out that way in which these understandings of rights function ideologically, but it does point towards the way in which our understanding of rights has this very important ideological and political function that I think is very, very important for us to understand. And the other thing I think is wh where we talk about policing is that we need to be very clear, I think, that analysis it doesn't equal blame. That quite mm. often when we start to analyse as academics, the attribution is made that we are seeking to blame the police. Where in actual fact, I think what we're trying to do is to understand what the potential underlying processes are and to articulate our theoretical understanding with the kind of data mm. that we extract out of these circumstances, one of which is the data around the way that they're represented, mm. and the other is the way in which the data talks to us about the underlying phenomenology, the people mm. involved and how they experienced it. And one thing that's very clear about that is that uh, for people involved, their understanding of policing was critically important. And as you say, there's this background context of, of stop and search that seems to feature very heavily in how people understood um, the, the, the reason that they were involved in the riots. But I think there's a problem here about the way that we talk about the riots as if it's some kind of singular event. Mm. And what strikes me from, from our analysis is that there is a complexity to these events that's somehow overwritten. Um, we, as you know, focused initially on trying to understand the origins of the riot outside of the police station in Tottenham, the mm. first of the, of the big riots. And where we looked at that, there was a complexity about the fact that there was a peaceful demonstration beforehand that went on for three hours. Mm. A lot of people don't know that uh, there was various attempts to get the police to uh, make a formal uh, acknowledgement to Mark Duggan's family that he had actually been shot and that that hadn't taken place. And that these processes seem to have, have, have played a role in in why that first riot uh, broke out. Do, do you think that that's, that's a valid way of looking at it? Well, I think the point you make there is hugely important in the sense that, you know, we, and I'm probably guilty of it too, but there's, there's always a danger in talking about, you know, the 2011 England riots, that somehow one implies that this, this, is, this is a singular set of events, you know, that could all be understood through the same frame. Mm. When what happened in Tottenham, as you're saying, on that Saturday evening was really quite different from what happened subsequently in Hackney, not maybe entirely, but certainly different from what then happened in Brixton, certainly from what happened in Ealing a couple of days later. And to try to make sense of, I think, the London riots as if they were singular events, but as if they were the same as what happened in Nottingham or Salford 
or Liverpool is to simplify enormously complicated events. And it was one of the great sadnesses, in a way, of reading the riots, I think, that um, quite unwittingly, I think, we played into the hands of people who would um, portray the research study itself mm -hmm. in that kind of singular monolithic way. In the, in the first day of publication, um, we had a front page story which set out a whole series of things about um, poverty, the impoverishment of local communities, the non-involvement of gangs, difficulties with the police, particularly around stop and search, the the difficulty in identifying any kind of clear ethnic participation or message within these riots and, and so on and so forth. Really all sorts of really quite complicated messages also around consumption and looting mm. and so forth. But the headline on the front of the newspaper was blame the police, why the rioters say they took part. And in a way what happened subsequently over the following five or six days of publicity was that that was the only frame of reference within which for lots of people at least, reading the riots was understood. Yeah, it was the danger of uh, trying to engage your theories with, and evidence with politics. Is it takes on the dynamics of politics once, once it's out there. And I think that's, it's very interesting that you, you, you bring that to bear on, on how people have interpreted uh, the complexity of the analysis in very simplistic terms, which has fed into uh, the ongoing political dispute. Because what struck me as well about the debates that were happening at the time was that there was a position put forward by the government that spoke to us very much about a police failure in terms of a failure to crack down. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it wouldn't be my interpretation of these events at all. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things I think about the 2011 riots is that um, for the first time really that I can remember they broke Michael Ignatieff's first rule of post riot political discourse, which is whatever else you do as a politician, praise the police. When what we had here, unlike the 1980s riots or, or those more recently, was politicians getting stuck into the police quite quickly, being deeply critical, indeed not only critical of the police, but implying that the escalation in police numbers and the shift to the extent there was a shift in police tactics towards the end of the four days of troubles was somehow a result of political intervention. Mm. Um, and that's an extraordinary shift, I think. But, but to a degree, um, and I'd be interested in your views on this, my interpretation of um, at least elements of the first two days of police response in London was that, although in part, I think, there was a lack of decisiveness because there was a lack of clarity about the extent to which or how much force should be used. Nonetheless, much of what was occurring was still influenced by a kind of Scarman-esque model of minimum use of force. Mm. Well, I think, I think it's important to contextualise where the police were at that point, which is just off the back of uh, a radical reform in policy that was uh, something that grew out of the G20 protest mm. and the key thing there is about making policing human rights compliant mm. um, and staying committed to the British policing model which is very much about minimal use of force mm. and I think there's a massive amount of misrepresentation about what the police were faced with as the riots began to grow and escalate. Now it couldn't have been the case that anybody would have had any understanding that these riots were growing until we saw the second round of rioting begin on the Sunday night in London. And at that point, and I would argue only at that point, could it have been justifiable to start thinking about some kind of major mobilisation. Mm. And that certainly occurred uh, by Monday. Mm. To mobilise from normal police duties, 7,000 cops onto the streets within 24 hours, I think is a major achievement. Mm. I think that that mobilisation itself had an escalatory dynamic. Mm. And that's particularly true, I think, around Hackney. Mm. Because by Monday afternoon, there was the expectation among everybody that there was going to be further disorder. So it was almost waiting to happen, and mm. everybody was kind of looking for it. Then, as I understand it, there was a stop and search incident in the Narrows in, in uh, Hackney. And as a consequence, police started to mobilise into that area. 
And when they mobilised into that area, it appears to me that they engaged in a, in a dispersal exercise that, that, that escalated the problem. Mm. But nonetheless, subsequently, by the following day, we have somewhere in the region of 16,000 mm. police on the streets of London. And what's critically important, I think, is that the disorder stopped. And the, the mobilisation had the effect, and it was a very rapid mobilisation. And as I say, to achieve that was, was, was quite an achievement. So to, to stand back then and say, well, something went wrong with our policing, mm. I think is more political discourse. It's more about trying to suggest that the problems aren't ones of government policy and so on and so forth. And I think that uh, we're wrong to, to, to see things in those terms. And I think that we need to be much more sophisticated in our understanding of how policing works and mm. how public order policing works and the principles around which public order policing is based. If we want to have a serious debate about the role of public order policing in these kind of uh, riot dynamics. I mean, I'm really interested to hear you say it, and I, I, I think I agree with everything you say, that, that huge numbers of police officers are mobilised across the country in most of our major urban centres. Mm. Actually, they manage to, much of the time, I think, rein in any desire there was, certainly political influence that there was, to see much more force used. Yeah, and I think political influence was, was a key dynamic here because there was clearly a drive on the part of the government to, to take a more reactionary position for, for whatever reason. But then we've got this sense in which the Metropolitan Police Service, when they reflect on how they dealt with the situation, one of the utterances that they use is that we fill prison cells, not hospital beds. But the 2011 riots did pose new problems for the police. First, that problem of being criticised for a lack of force in an environment where they're also uh, uh, criticised for an overbearing force mm. and to find a position within that that was going to be acceptable. But the, the fact that they were criticised for uh, being too soft opened up a new door. And that door was very much about feeling as though the British public was in a position to accept something more in terms of, uh, of police use of force. And that, that something more is the use of firearms. And the use of firearms was uh, something that grew out of Birmingham. And you remember that one of the features of the, the rioting in Birmingham was that there were groups, gangs, uh, organised groups uh, who were, were armed with live ammunition and did, mm. did fire live mm. ammunition at police. So what we see then is subsequently the HMIC inquiry into police responses during the riots starts to uh, enable serious discussion and development of tactics based around use of live ammunition in, in riot situations. And unfortunately what, what we're in now is a situation where that tactic exists. Mm. So we've got a change in how policing is in this country which I think has somewhat gone under the radar. But when I look at the analysis that was put forward by the Metropolitan Police about the riots, one of the things about their report, I think it's called Four Days in August, mm. is it points actually very, very clearly to a failure of dialogue. That when they try to analyse the origins of the riots in Tottenham, they make very clear that there were failures in respect to communicating with the uh, with the family of Mark Duggan and that there were failures in dealing in a communicative way with the protest that gathered outside of the, uh, of, of the police station. Um, and that it was those failures in communication that had a big impact on the dynamics of, mm. of that event. And it strikes me that if we hadn't have had the riot in Tottenham, uh, w we may not have had the spread. But that brings us to a, a key point about the 2011 riots, the spread. Mm. Many people would call it the contagion, if you like, the, the spread from Tottenham, firstly into London, and then into other cities. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on, on the spread and, and how the spread happened, why the spread happened? Well, I think it's, I, I mean, it's, it's a kind of constant question in relation to you know, major outbreaks of rioting. We've seen it plenty of times before. Um, perhaps the big difference between the riots of 2011 and those of 1981 and 1985 is the speed with which yeah. the rioting spread. You know, the, here, here we're talking three days, essentially. Three to four days max for this to cover five, six, seven cities. Mm. Whereas in the mid-1980s, it's three months from Brixton then to other parts of London and outside of London. 
Why that should be the case and how these things spread, I think, is, is really, to a degree, one of the big unanswered questions in social science, yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're much further forward in, in all this. I mean, I'd be interested in your, your views in it, but that's, that's my sense of it. To, to the extent that speed here was um, an obvious characteristic of 2011, I think some of that is, is to do with the availability of various forms of media now. Mm -hmm both traditional media, but 24-hour rolling news and so forth, is the constant, as it were, presence of pictures um, and huge amounts of information, um, actually, uh, both on the web and on TV about the riots, but also the use of social media, mm. which allowed people to communicate in ways which had obviously not been possible in almost every previous experience mm. of writing. But that doesn't get us further than beginning to think about sort of the speed and malleability of riots. I don't think it tells us much about contagion. Um, where This is possibly, though, where the question about why riots don't happen in certain places mm. becomes particularly pertinent. Mm -hmm. um, so we can ask questions about what it was about Birmingham or Manchester or St Anne's in Nottingham or various parts of outlying parts of Liverpool which produced, you know, where tensions and grievances and so forth then spilled into violence or, or looting or both. But perhaps the kind of social scientific question and, and our kind of theoretical attempts to make sense of these things is aided most of all by looking at places where you might plausibly think this writing, this contagion, if we like that mm -hmm. word, might have reached. Mm but where for some reason things were brought under control and didn't tip yeah. into full-scale writing. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's, it's about the pattern of that spread, the pattern of collective action. And as you were aware, my, my background is in crowd psychology and uh, our journey of theoretical development in crowd psychology has been very much informed by the social historians of the, of the 20th century, mm. Rude A. Thompson and so on who make very clear that one of the things that we need to understand about rioting, uh, certainly um, as industrial society develops, is that it has a normative pattern that can't be understood in terms of contagion theory, the, uh, the dominant idea that somehow we, we see this spread disease-like because of the underlying pathology of, of group psychology, crowd psychology. And that where we look at the patterns of collective action that occur in riots, they're very normatively structured. So if we then translate that into the 2011 riots and go back to our conversation about the requirement to understand in a more nuanced way about what went on, the first question we need to ask is, well, what were the patterns? What were the patterns of rioting? And we've seen some interesting work by, uh, by colleagues of mine, uh, Roger Ball and uh, John Drury, who've done some analysis of that. Uh, that talk about different types of riot. Mm -hmm. That if we take riots uh, like Tottenham and like Hackney and look at the patterns of collective action, we see very much they're targeted at the police. Mm -hmm. And there's actually very little <coughs> looting that goes on. Um, and where looting mm -hmm. does occur, it's quite often about getting ammunition to attack the police mm -hmm. and so on. And so and forth. the same, for what it's worth, is true of St Anne's in Nottingham and to a degree what happened in Liverpool, I would say. So we've got and that, Salford. that pattern yeah. of, of, of rioting, but then. We've also got corresponding what, what, uh, what they call um, more focused on, on class-based riots. So if we take uh, things like Enfield and places like that where the pattern of collective action changes, where you've got groups mobilising into areas that are understood to be affluent mm. and attacking symbols of wealth and not appropriating but destroying. Mm. And then you've got a corresponding third type that we can consider as a commodity riot, but it, it becomes problematic to even call it a riot because mm. there's, there's not so much... Um, attempts to attack the police, there's not so much violence, it's very much about avoiding the police and uh, appropriating. So mm. different patterns of collective action and not, we can't conceptualise all of those events in those terms. So when we look at that spread and we start to, to consider the contagion, one of the key challenges we've got, as you point out, is not simply explaining why violence spread, it's also explaining why violence didn't spread, what were the limits of that spread uh, in terms of, of cities like uh, Nottingham becoming violent and problematic, Birmingham becomes violent and problematic, um, but, but uh, Sheffield and, and Leeds don't. Mm. Now I know that you've done some work um, around 
the situation in, in, in Leeds in that respect. Because, of course, Leeds was a city, is a city that has a history of, of rioting, particularly in, in, in Chapel Town. Mm. And one of the things that I wanted us to discuss today was, um, was the situation in Chapel Town and why, why things didn't escalate uh, to any great extent there. What, what would you say the, the, the data that you've, you've come across from, from Chapel Town tells you about, about, about why, why riots didn't develop here? Well, my starting point in all this is to, or was, to look for areas which you might plausibly think disorder might have spread to, which is to say that in some sense they share some of the structural, social, economic, political and cultural characteristics of those neighbourhoods and communities where rioting did break out, mm -hmm. so Tottenham or Hackney or, or wherever else. Now, Chapel Town, I think, falls fairly and squarely, more obviously than almost anywhere into that, as a, a district, a neighbourhood, which, as you say, has a history of rioting, has a history and a long-standing one of less than ideal police community relations, conflict with the police. Historically has been a relatively impoverished community by any measure. The broad, I would say, structural and economic characteristics are there. Then, beyond that, Chapel Town has the very, the, the, the unique characteristic of itself having seen a shooting. Um, in the midst of the disorder carrying on elsewhere in the country. So if you like something which, you know, in some theories might be characterized as a spark or a flashpoint, mm -hmm. um, with, subsequent, with some subsequent disorder, but not something which probably would be characterized as full-scale writing. So, I mean, it seemed to me um, to have all the kind of major elements which would allow you in some way to explore this rather underexplored question of, um, of why riots don't, or in this occasion, didn't happen. Yeah. We see there that in the context of the spread of violence on the, on the Monday in particular, where there were widespread concerns across the UK, in the Chapel Town district there was a young man um, who, who was shot, uh, ultimately died four days later. It portrays a situation that was very, very volatile. Um, and then I understand that the incident develops into uh, something far more serious. And uh, we had a, a situation where, where um, a senior police commander was, was assaulted. Um, and what we then see is a, is a slightly more um, challenging set of circumstances about uh, a pressure to, to intervene here on the part of the police as a function of, firstly, the expectation that <coughs> riots were, were going to develop as part of the wider spread of the disorder, uh, but secondly, because of the serious nature of, of what's just happened to the, to the police commander. What, what are your mm. thoughts? Our researcher spoke to both Lutal and Claude originally, and, and I mean, I, it strikes me that that moment the moment where they um, are contacted by the police commander, go to the police headquarters, go to the police station, and um, there's a dialogue. Um, the police, understandably, are all effectively tooled up and ready to go. And an agreement is made for a brief period mm -hmm. where they have some freedom to go and talk to people, negotiate, get out on the streets, see if the situation can be calmed in any kind of way is the most extraordinary moment. Mm. Because what it illustrates, almost better than anything, I think, beyond, as it were, the, the extraordinary work they did, is the position a senior police commander finds themselves in under these circumstances, which is frankly between a rock and a hard place. So in this particular case, you've got the most, you've, you've got huge political pressure you know, by this stage, at least behind the scenes, senior figures in Whitehall are being deeply critical of um, members of the Metropolitan Police and no doubt other forces besides. There's a lot of political messages going out saying we don't want any more of this, we want this calmed, whatever it takes, mm. folks, 
we want this to stop. Um, as you say, um, there's been a shooting, tensions are very high um, in Chapel Town between the black and Asian community, between the community and the police, all the kind of building blocks for something really serious. There, The police commander has herself been attacked. Um, the police are ready to go to, to stop, to put the brake on at that stage is by any measure an, a, an extraordinarily brave poli police act. Mm. Because if you do the sort of counterfactual history, how would that have been understood had it worked out differently? Had major rioting broken out? Mm. Had someone or several people been very badly healed or, uh, hurt or worse still killed? How would that act then have been interpreted? Yeah. Not well is, mm. is the answer. Yeah. And so, you know, it, everything hinges on that, it seems to me. That's the moment, if you're looking for a moment, where the story of Ch Chapel Town yeah. at least has the potential for change. It was a, a, a critical 40 minutes. And as you say, that 40 minutes put that police commander in an incredibly difficult position where she was experiencing pressure from, from above and in some senses from below. Mm. Uh, to intervene and I think it's important to contextualize it in the way that you did there that this was Monday afternoon where I think around about sort of two three perhaps four o'clock David Cameron had come out and openly criticized the police for uh, for being uh, too reticent about intervening so that that pressure must have been acute and when we when we look to what they then did what strikes me as most important about it was that they gave space for community-based interventions, that essentially this was a space in which uh, what we might call a neighbourhood policing model mm. based around dialogue and community engagement mm. was given space to operate that then uh, starts to see some sort of subsequent benefit in, in de-escalation. Mm. Um, does, do you think that, that that is reflected in, in the data from reading the riots as well? Very strongly, and, and in two ways, I would say. I mean, not only reflected in the data collected in Leeds, but also, to reinforce a point you've made, in the data collected in Tottenham, which is to say that's precisely what didn't happen in, in Tottenham, I think. So your diagnosis, which is that um, the 48 hours in between the shooting of Mark Duggan and the eventual escalation into something close to full-scale disorder in Tottenham is something, I think, arguably, that could have been prevented, the, the, that, that full-scale disorder. And precisely the problem was the absence of communication, the failure to talk to the family, the failure to invite the family into the police station, or alternatively to have senior officers capable of engaging in serious dialogue with people on the streets and enabling family and friends to talk to others out on the streets with the potential of de-escalating the trouble mm -hmm. is what was what is what simply what didn't occur as it were. so it's the reverse what yeah. didn't happen yeah. story i think and in particular i mean one doesn't want to single out individuals but as it were the experience in chapel town of a, um, a well-established set of relationships between community organizers and the local police commander is something which didn't really exist in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the local police commander there simply didn't have a history or set of relationships which might have so easily enabled, I think, the kind of dialogue and communication that was necessary to de-escalate. On the one hand, the Metropolitan Police is a big organisation and one of the difficulties here is that the, the local police in operation uh, had to interface with, with a, um, a pan-London operation. When we transfer this analysis to Chapel Town, as you point out in your analysis, that it is based around the capability for some kind of prior investment in a community police uh, trust and confidence mm. issue that can only come from some significant investment in that prior to the events themselves. It's because there had been that investment in community-based organisations from funding from local uh, authorities, one presumes, and also an investment by the police in a neighbourhood policing model to build up mm. trust and confidence that they were able to exploit that at those critical moments. And that's not something you can just plug in on the day, it's something that has to be a strategic commitment
on the part of local authorities mm. and the police to invest in that social capital. The financial metaphor, as it were, is, the, is an important one here in the sense, I mean, it's not just a metaphor, but, but the idea that, you know, personal, cultural and individual and social capital is vital here. And those are things which don't, as it were, spring up in some kind of um, unthought through overnight way. The things which re require a huge amount of background work, and indeed to pick up your phrase, which is absolutely the right one, investment, both personal and individual investment, and financial, social, cultural investment in local communities. So on the one hand, the more particular thing is, it requires individuals doing this work over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. you know, Individuals, community organisers, community folk like Lutal and Claude, over many years establishing relationships and trust both within the community and with the police service, but also local police officers mm -hmm. from the local police commander, no doubt, on down through neighbourhood officers, working day after day, week after week to establish relationships, bonds, a degree of trust. And then beyond that, as you say, I think social investment economic investment in local communities. We started out by saying, you know, one of the reasons that you would, you would focus on Chapel Town as a place with at least the potential for disorder is not just its history, but its history of impoverishment. Mm -hmm. And it's only by, and you know, what's been sad to see, I think, in the aftermath of, of the riots is the failure to take the opportunity to invest properly mm -hmm. in communities, both affected by riots and also, in this case, not so affected by riots, mm -hmm. to try to, as it will, build the basis for the emergence of that kind of capital. Yeah, and I think that that's particularly true in a context of austerity, where the debates are very much about where are we going to invest limited funds. And what strikes me as quite problematic is that the community activists that pay, played such an important role in preventing the escalation, potentially in, in Chapel Town, if our analysis is correct, uh, are now finding themselves uh, with money being withdrawn from their organisation. Uh, their view is that, in a sense, their intervention has been counterproductive because had there been disorder in Chapel Town, had there been then the perception that there were underlying failures that need to be addressed, that the likelihood is, is that the council may well not have withdrawn the funding that they actually require is so central to the successes that we think underpinned why it was uh, that you didn't get the spread. Yeah, I mean, you can understand the frustration, I think, if, if, that's, if that's the case. And there's a kind of bitter irony if, you know, people whose work is so central to what is a success story, feel that, you know, um, it's, it's had some rather unfortunate, unintended consequences. But of course, I guess what I'd say is that what, you know, what people have to hang on to is the fact that as a result of their intervention, their community was not burnt to the ground. Um, you know, so the, as it were, the positive outcome is that local facilities such as they are, albeit now perhaps without investment, don't require complete rebuilding. And you know what we saw in so many places around England in 2011 was just appalling destruction. And destruction which takes years and years, assuming there is any investment, mm -hmm. to even get back to where you were, albeit in a fairly poor, impoverished state in August 2011. Okay. Rather reinforcing the last point. Ironically, um, you know, Chapel Town found itself in 2011 in a slightly better position than it might otherwise have been because of inward investment, at least some inward investment, and investment precisely because it had been a place where previously there'd been riots. Mm. Um, so, you know, in a sense, that both is a positive story, I think, in that it helps identify what potentially might be a sort of some protective factor mm. in some small way against disorder having occurred in 2011. But with the irony then, the, the, the absence of riots on this occasion may have served to bring about something quite different, which mm -hmm. is the withdrawal of funding from some particularly crucial local services. I think one of the important um, issues that we have to confront around analysis of the riots is that unlike the 1980s riots where we, we saw the Scarman report, a kind of official, uh, official analysis, 
and subsequent academic interest funded by, by the research councils and so on. We saw a great deal of academic analysis, theoretical analysis. Um, from within criminology there was uh, uh, the growth of, of, of particular perspectives that, that culminated, one could argue, in, in, in David Waddington's Flashpoints model. And in social psychology, uh, the growth and development of a, a social identity perspective. I wondered if we could start to discuss mm. now um, how we, where we are following the 2011 riots academically. Have, mm. have we, are we at a point where our academic theory is adequate to, to explain and understand what went on? And if, if it is or if, if not, what, where do we need to see our developments? I think the whole territory of the sort of theoretical, the attempt at theoretical explanation of writing and its absence is an intriguing one in the sense that, um, as I think you've rightly said to me, much of the sort of sociological work is a, is grew out of and was a reaction to both what occurred in the 1980s in terms of writing, but also the political context in which those things were, those um, experiences were, un were understood. Now, I, I personally have found, when coming to think about the, the 2011 riots, the flashpoints model quite helpful. And, but, but let me say how, um, because I think this is important and leads potentially to what I think is uh, um, a possible useful dialogue between sociology and social psychology here, which is the flashpoints model, it seems to me, is very helpful analytically, which is to say, in terms of trying to make sense, so far as I was concerned, of the complex and very varied conditions under which writing took place, and the very complex variety of events that we try to describe under the label riots, that distinguishing analytically between various levels, whatever we may wish to call them, but structural, cultural, political, contextual and interactional, is, is a useful way of compartmentalizing, albeit I think analytically rather than actually, compartmentalizing our thinking about things as varied as the history of a local community all the way through to the potential analysis of the precise interactions between members of crowds, the police mm -hmm. or, or, or others. But um, the difficulty I think comes when trying to, for example, um, get into the detail of the differences between, precisely between, in some ways our subjects today, why writing occurs, for example, as an illustration in one place but not in another. Then the model, I think, possibly requires some greater specification or an alternative approach which allows you to think more about the very specific details, both not just contextually but interactionally, of what occurs uh, in particular temporal and geographic spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I, I, I share your positive view on flashpoints. I think it is a, a major contribution to our theoretical understanding of, of disorder. What he also makes clear is that it's the meanings of those interactions and the perceptions of people involved in them that are very, very important to understand. Yet, at the same time, it's an area of the theory that I think it's at its weakest mm. and at which point the social identity perspective that, mm. that equally re-injects meaning into collective action in riots um, focuses at that interactional level to help us to understand the dynamics through which uh, these things come about. And I think that where we look at those early academic debates around rioting and public order policing, we've got this very important debate that went on um, with the Waddingtons, the, mm. the Peter and David, the Tank and, and David Waddington debates, that were where Peter Waddington focused uh, his critique on, of the Flashpoints model in much the same terms that you just have, is that he argues that it's quite circular, that on the one hand it doesn't really help us to understand why we get that variation, because all of the conditions 
um, in one place, for example in Chapel Town and, and in London, are, are the same at that contextual level. But in one place we don't get violence and in the other we do. And the, the only reason that we can even consider these moments as flashpoints is because disorder breaks out. Uh, if it doesn't break out then we don't mm. get a flashpoint and we can't, it, it's a kind of circular analysis. Mm. And I think that this is a big limitation about where we, we are at the moment. And I think the other issue to, to bear in mind is, is that there is a requirement here for some kind of interdisciplinary dialogue. Mm. We are, I think, at a place in academia where the challenges of the 21st century can only be addressed in interdisciplinary terms and that we need to learn from each other to start to address these limitations in, mm. a, in a meaningful way. And one of the things that uh, strikes me about your analyses, um, both of the presence and the absence of disorder, is that they talk to us very clearly about the centrality of those, those interaction processes. Mm. Would, would you say that that's a, a fair understanding? Well, I th I, yes, I think it is. I mean, what, what's interesting for me, I mean, talking to you about, um, as it were, these complex events is, you know, I'm a sociologist by training, not a psychologist. And I suppose one of the things that I have just struggled with for a very long time is um, I think sociology has been quite good at enabling us to see in um, more or less nuanced ways the, and, and understand, as it were, the, both the, the, the kind of long-standing and broad, but also more immediate social and economic and political contexts within which rioting does and doesn't occur. But what's always been missing and what is inherently problematic in all explanations, I think, though you'll explain why it's le much less problematic from a social psychological perspective, is what's the mechanism? How is it that those things become translated into forms of action or reaction, um, which we would understand as violence and disorder mm. and so forth. And, and sociological theory has been very good, if you like, on the moral economy of the crowd, mm. but, much, but much less good, and this would be Tank, Tank Waddington's criticism, I think, on what are the mechanisms yeah. that enable this to occur. And that's what's attracted me to, well, through, through your encouragement, to read and try to engage with the social identity model mm. as um, something which offers the possibility of making sense of, of interpreting precisely that, mm -hmm. that interactional mechanism. Yeah, and I think it's important in that sense to, to, to articulate at some level a, a meta-theoretical perspective that on the one hand, if we look at flashpoints, to, to a certain extent it's, it's a model that points us towards um, contextual or social determination, that there are these broad contextual mm. structural issues that feed into the processes through which um, through which riots develop. Whereas the social identity perspective is is a, is a, a theoretical model that grows up in a meta theoretical context of of interactionism. That we recognise that at some level the self is socially determined. Mm. Who we are, how we define ourselves, and what we feel it's appropriate to do as a consequence is not something just about our individuality and that we have a way of defining ourselves in terms of our group membership and that the definitions of, of self in those terms, what it means to be a male, what it means to be a socialist, for example, are, are socially determined. Mm. Where we understand this at the level of the self, we can begin to understand how and why it is that collective action in the context of a riot takes on a socially determined form. Mm. But what we've also begun to understand is that where we see the uh, patterns of collective action in a riot as an outcome of social identity processes, that those social identity processes can be shaped and reshaped mm. in the context of the interactions of a crowd event. Mm. And that's why public <coughs> order policing is so important mm. to how and why it is that often riots come about. And one of the things that I think we fail to articulate um, in the academic debates is the way in which when we theorise and talk about riots, we're always talking about big urban riots, the 1980, 81, mm. the 2011. But there are riots happening all the time in football, at the poll tax, mm. demonstrations, so on. Mm. And these processes are, are quite observable on an ongoing basis to understand how it is that collective mm. 
violence, collective conflict comes about in a crowd event. I mean, there's something of an irony, it feels to me, in this, in, in the terminology and the nomenclature that's used, because the social identity model, the elaborated social identity model, focuses in the main, I'm not saying for a moment that it doesn't take account of the broader, deeper structural issues, but it focuses its primary attention mm. on the more immediate interactional... Yeah, kind of the micro-sociology. On the, the micro-sociology yeah. of violent events in this yeah, case, yeah. Or, or their absence, yeah. yes. In different, not that I particularly want to use the terminology, but, but in, in a different way, you could say that its primary focus is on what sometimes would be thought of as flashpoints. Mm -hmm. yeah? Those things which, if they turn out one way, might lead to violence or in another might lead to the de-escalation de of conflicts. Yeah. Yeah. As you say, the micro-sociological interaction of yeah. particular groups under certain circumstances. Yeah. The irony is, I think, that to the extent that the flashpoints model doesn't really focus in detail, I mean, it allows for those things, but doesn't focus mm. in, a, in a kind of structured analytical way on those interactions. It's misnamed that actually the model that we know of as the flashpoints model is primarily, as you were describing it, um, and probably as I have mainly used it, as something which helps us um, focus our attentions on those um, broader, and deeper social structural conditions under which the micro sociological events then become important. Yeah, the meanings. And what, what's important about our analysis as well is that we too are focused on, on particularly important other debates, primarily within our own discipline uh, originally, about trying to move away from reductionist, psychologically reductionist models of, of, of the self and. Uh, um, in order to explain the social determination of behaviour. And those broader uh, macro social contextual determinants are addressed initially in Steve Reich's development of the model, initially around the St Paul's riot, to locate the determining role of the context of, of antagonism between uh, certain institutions of the state, the police, the social security system and so on, feeding into a particular sense of what it means to be black in Britain in the 1980s and how that sense of self then feeds into these patterns of collective action and help us to understand it. He was arguing against the Le Bonian irrationalist model to say, look, you can't explain this mm. without some notion of the social determination of self. And my work, as you quite rightly point out, then begins to grow and develop that model by focusing on the, on the micro-sociology. And for us, when we begin to look at the development of riots, such as the poll tax riot, it becomes clear that there is a group level dynamic, an intergroup interaction that can occur um, in a crowd event, that where people in the crowd perceive out-group action as illegitimate, that that can create the conditions for identity change such that people can become unified in opposition to the police. And that unity changes the power dynamic. So there's a legitimacy and power dynamic that, that goes on in crowds that helps us to begin to articulate the processes through which, as you point out, the flashpoint mm. essentially starts to develop. Mm. So it seems to me that what we're looking at here is a fantastic opportunity to mm. start uh, a very meaningful debate in terms of taking criminological theory forward and that one of the opportunities that we might have here is to start a rich debate around flashpoints and around the social identity model as, a, as an attempt to try to advance our, our theoretical understanding of, of these kinds of incidents. Mm, absolutely. Great. Okay, so thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk with us today, it's Tim. Been I hope, uh, it's been a uh, pleasure. It's been terrific. for you. It has been for me. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. It's a great pleasure. It's been great.